we might be about to start more or less on time. Uh, um, I don't even know what to do. I'm a little bit, um, Trina Kayla, actually, about that. Um, it's unusual for us to start on a Monday evening uh, on time. Hi, I'm Colleen Parsons. If you don't know me, I um, teach in the English department here, and I'm director of Global Irish Studies. Uh, and you are very welcome to our last event of the calendar year, or sorry, of the of the academic year. Um, and I was thinking today about what a year it has been, and I was exhausted when I got to the end of it. Um, but we started in September with the Symposium on Ulysses. We moved to the Royal Irish Academy in Dublin in November for a big conference on transatlantic relations. We, uh, on that, we worked with our colleagues in uh, University College Dublin, Queen's University. Uh, in March, we joined the Good Friday Agreement bandwagon mm -hmm. and had a major conference at American University with our colleagues in Ulster University. And in between, we've had a lot of individual events. And I'm not picking favorites, but my favorite event was last Tuesday, which was when our nine Global Irish Studies student fellows presented their research in progress, uh, which was nothing against all of the rest of you who spoke and took part in our events, but it was just really great to see our students come together and share the work they've been doing over the last year. Um, I have a few words to say tonight. I want to say a uh, very welcome, very special welcome. We have a special guest here. Um, Tonight, in the person of Minister Jennifer Carroll McNeil from the Minister of Finance in Dublin, a Ministry of Finance in Dublin. Uh, you're very welcome, Minister. Delighted to have you. Um, and of course, I want to uh, welcome Ambassador Geraldine Byrne Nason back to campus for, I think you've been here about every month uh, this year. So, uh, very welcome back to campus. And uh, Ambassador Byrne Nason will make a few opening remarks uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, welcome also, as always, to our Georgetown students, faculty, staff, alumni. Um, you are what sustains us. You are the reason we are here, and we appreciate your enthusiastic engagement uh, and support. We're delighted to be co-hosting tonight's event with the Department of History. I know a um, few of our colleagues in the History Department are here, um, so welcome, welcome to you. Happy, happy we're here. And as always, I want to thank the Mortara Center. Um, for having us here and giving us a room. Uh, the room was given to the Mortara Center by Nancy and Paul Pelosi, who have a little plaque over here. You may have heard of them. Uh, and they generously lend this room out to colleagues across the university free of charge. So we're always delighted to be in the Mortara Center. They have always been very, very good to us. Um, this evening's feature speaker is Dr. Dara Gannon, who will be well known to many of you since he has been here in Georgetown since uh, September of last year as a visiting Fulbright Scholar in the History Department. He is um, teaching two classes this semester, and I see some of his students in the audience, so that means Dara, it's not going so badly, I think. Um, although exams are due next week, so they might be just, you know. Um, but he has been teaching two classes in the history department. Um, he comes to us from University College Dublin, um, and uh, where he's head of Irish studies. He is a graduate of Maynooth University, with two graduates of Maynooth University speaking tonight. And he's taught uh, at Maynooth University, at Queen's University Belfast, at University College Dublin. And he's also worked in the National Museum of Ireland and in the Epic Emigration Museum in Dublin. Um, so he has a very extensive experience in public history. Um, throughout the island of Ireland. Dara has published so widely on the history of the Irish diaspora and the Irish revolution that I can't read it all, but I'll give you some highlights. Um, first, uh, Proclaiming a Republic, Ireland 1916 and the National Collection, um, which is from Irish Academic Press. Uh, Ireland 1922, beautiful copies of which you have seen uh, being presented just now. Um, uh, Independence, Partition, and Civil War, edited with his colleague in Queen's University, Fergal McGarry. And Conflict, Diaspora, and Empire, Irish Nationalism in Britain, 1912 to 1922, which is forthcoming from Cambridge University Press, like, within hours. <laughs> uh, within weeks, I think, yep. Um, and he also has a second monograph uh, under contract uh, with Cambridge University Press, which is due to be published next year or the year after. Um, and that is Worlds of Revolution, Ireland's Global Moment. Dara's talk this evening uh, will, in one sense, mark an end here at Georgetown University to what has been called the Decade of Centenaries or Commemorations in Ireland, um, a series of events reflecting on tumultuous decade in Irish history, filled with strikes, revolutions, war, women's suffrage, the first woman elected to the House of Commons, 
a small unknown book called Ulysses, Nobel Prize and more. It was a pretty exciting decade. The decade also lasted 11 years from 1912 to 1923, but, um, and while I am often, it's a baker's decade, um, while I am often the first to complain about the endless cycle of commemorations that has been going on for the last 10 years or so, I do want to acknowledge that it was out of a series of such events here on campus in Georgetown in 2016, marking the centenary of the Easter Rising, that my colleagues, Dr. Irene Gilson and the late Dr. Jared Mannion and I came up with the idea of having an Irish studies program at Georgetown University. So something good came out of this decade of centenaries. And through it all, we've sought to look forward in our remembering to shape a new field, a future for the field of Irish studies from here in Georgetown and in Washington, DC. And Dara's visit, Dara Gannon's visit and Dara's talk with its focus on global dimensions of Irish history is an ideal example of that kind of work, the work that we want to foster and support here in Georgetown, setting out a new agenda for how we talk and think about Ireland in its second century. Um, given the global nature of Dara's work and the position of this lecture is closing out the decade of centenary, we're particularly honored that um, our ambassador, Geraldine Byrne Nason, will say a few words um, of, uh, of a few remarks of, uh, before Dara talks. Um, it's very fitting that of, uh, of all the potential openers, it will be the ambassador who comes to us from a small provincial town up the road called New York, uh, where she was permanent representative or ambassador of Ireland to the United Nations. Um, uh, while in New York, she chaired the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women, and she was instrumental in Ireland's successful campaign to gain a seat on the UN Security Council. She also led the program through uh, the two years of, on the Europe, UN Security Council. She has previously served among many, many other senior positions as ambassador to France and to the EU, to key missions. She too, as I mentioned, graduated from Maynooth University and was an awarded, awarded an honorary doctorate from there. And most impressive to all of us in universities, um, which I just found out today, and I'm very sorry I didn't know this, uh, um, Geraldine Byrne Nason is a member of the prestigious Royal Irish Academy, uh, to which she was elected in 2014. So I'm delighted to have the ambassador here and to hand over to her to make a few remarks before Dara takes over and um, tells us about mapping the Irish world from Washington, Ireland to London, Ireland. Thanks, Geraldine. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed, Colleen. Delighted to be here. When you said provincial Irish town, I expected Drogheda to be that, that, that didn't happen. Look, um, I'm very honoured to be here. Always happy to be on the campus here in uh, in Georgetown. And uh, this is my maiden uh, uh, arrival here in uh, the Nancy Paul and Nancy Pelosi uh, Centre. So uh, delighted, delighted to be here. Um, and I also want to welcome uh, our minister, Minister Jennifer, if I may, um, from, uh, from Dublin. Great to have you with us this evening. Um, Colleen, I want to say a big thanks to you and your colleagues um, straight away uh, for what you've described now as the genius of uh, having uh, the Global Irish Studies Programme here. You do absolutely incredible work, really par excellence, I have to say. And um, that's recognised here. Um, but certainly also more generally, since I've taken up this role uh, a number of months ago, I make it my business to, to see Irish uh, Global Studies programmes wherever we are in the US, and you uh, stand out uh, as an extraordinary um, uh, contribution to the work that we're doing on that. So thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm really pleased that I'm representing a government that sees the value of that work, and that's happy to continue to support the programme, not just here, but uh, right across uh, universities, indeed across the globe, but particularly across this great country, um, uh, that we have the vision to do that, I think is, is important uh, for the point you made about the next century uh, that we have ahead of us. So we're looking this evening at no smaller, no smaller uh, job, dear Dara, than mapping the Irish world. I'm really looking forward to hearing from you about that and what you call the lieu de memoir of, of Global Ireland, which I think is a very appropriate way of 
at least uh, defining the base from which you you project uh, the work that you're doing. Those of you who know the decade of centenaries, of course, uh, see it as I think uh, Colleen was saying, a rather expansive project. It's essentially given people um, at home in Ireland and abroad a, a really unique opportunity to reflect on the founding of our state, uh, the ensuing challenges, and as you know, there were some and still, still remain challenges. And importantly, just looking at the progress that we've made in between. Uh, you know, as Irish people, we've approached it from a very wide lens perspective. We have all our partners engaged back in Ireland. The state partners are engaged. The local authorities are involved. We have institutes of learning, custodians of record, artists, historians, uh, all coming together with media organizations, reflecting um, on the leaders and the key actors, but also on the impact and the experience. But for me, most importantly, on the experience of ordinary people, the people who have lived through extraordinary times. And I think we owe them nothing less uh, as we now are speaking from a platform, as I see it, of a very 21st century, progressive, economically successful global Ireland. Um, and that's the country that I'm really proud to represent here. As a prelude uh, this evening, I want to acknowledge, and you touched on a little bit, Colleen, that some in Ireland, or maybe even here, have seen the decade of commemorations as a, an interminable national soul-searching exercise. Of others and most people, I would say, have seized it as an opportunity to reflect on the totality of the of Ireland of the island of Ireland's history of the period, and in doing that, we have opened the windows, opened our minds, really, to the legitimacy of all traditions on the island. Brian Cowan was the T-shirt back in 2010 when the idea of the decade was conceived, and I think he then captured it in a very uh, opposite way. He said, "The traditions that I've just mentioned, the traditions that draw their identity and collective memory from our shared history." And I, for one, am convinced that we have gone about that in good faith. It's up to others to uh, judge the results, but we have approached it in that way. Um, many of you here, of course, 2023, recognize that as the conclusion of the 11 years of the decade that Colleen described. Um, but of course, importantly, uh, the centenary of the Irish Civil War, the conclusion of the Irish Civil War. And let's be blunt and frank about it, the process of building our state was messy. It was a complex one. And as we look to take our place among the nations of the earth, we lived through, conducted traumatic civil war, and it has an enduring legacy. Time and distance naturally allow for perspective, new perspectives, and a deeper understanding of the period and its complexity. And I'm really glad that we're allowing the space to do that this year. I think it's a very important discussion. We're at a unique moment in the trajectory of the history of modern Ireland, when we now have a government uh, that comprises both Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil, recently having just swapped over, as you will all know, the role of Taoiseach. So leadership of government swapped from Fine Gael, from Fianna Fáil to Fine Gael. Those two parties, for decades embodied the binary nature of political division on the island in the south of Ireland. Some have courageously said that this government uh, more or less says this is the end of history, Irish style. Um, and uh, I'm not so sure I would make as courageous a claim as that. But I, I do think it's remarkable as we reflect now in 2023 that those uh, politicians whose predecessors assassinated and executed each other are now sitting peacefully. That's right, Minister, isn't it? Peacefully, peacefully at the cabinet table um, together, uh, leading this wonderful country uh, that I represent. From there, uh, I think it's important to say both of those political parties have together overseen an ethical and an inclusive approach to the decade which I think has been seen to go at least some way, make a more uh, a courageous claim than that, some way to repairing fractures that we have known have been there and there over time. Um, 
from a more global perspective, 2023 is also uh, the centenary of Ireland's joining of the League of Nations, which was a seminal moment on the European um, continent. And we even fielded the third, and as it happened, sadly, the last Secretary General of the League of Nations, Sean Lester. And when its doors closed, that young Irish nation still um, kept the global outlook that we had emerged with. And we carried that to the UN, which we joined in 1955. We've always, always sought to be a contributor uh, on the global stage through the UN system, and particularly in peace and security. Um, I'm never tired of saying we are the only country on the globe that has a, an unbroken record of peacekeeping um, uh, in the service of, of UN missions since that first deployment we made just three years, pretty remarkable, joined the UN in 55 when we have our, our own people out on the ground internationally keeping the peace three years later. It was in the same year in 58, Ireland also introduced the first of what we call the Irish resolutions at the UN in the adoption of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT, and I've just met a member of the audience uh, who works broadly speaking in the WND field. Um, Almost half a century later, that NPT remains at the heart of international efforts to achieve a world free of nuclear weapons. So 19, or 1958 marked a moment when we moved off the platform as a global player. And as Colin said, I was proud to serve as Ireland's ambassador at the Security Council uh, for two years, where we won an elected seat addressing complex and challenging uh, international issues from humanitarian access in Syria to women, peace and security. And importantly, I was there on the night that Putin illegally invaded Ukraine and we heard about it while sitting at that Security Council. Of course, 2023, uh, also uh, the centenary of another literary um, development, WB Yeats's Nobel Prize, emphasizing um, in many ways the, uh, that the decade tumultuous and challenging as it was, also produced great strides in art and, and culture. And I think that we need that link to be even further explored uh, in places like this. It was the decade of Michael Collins, Eamon de Valera, Mark Constance Markfitch, but Joyce and Yates, also generations of Irish artists and writers contributing to the tradition um, who still share our collective voice abroad and our collective sense of who and what we are. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention in terms of anniversaries here that 2023 is a quarter of a century, if I'm allowed to do that, since the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, a remarkable document that needed political leadership, vision, courage, compromise, but it certainly allowed us to break the cycle of violence uh, that had ravaged that precious island we inhabit for over 30 years. So although we're very far from a centenary of the Good Friday Agreement, I think the progress in the quarter of a century has been, has been extraordinary. And I want, in the company of everyone here, to repeat um, what uh, the Irish government never tires of saying, that the United States played a central role throughout that peace process, and that the bipartisan support of the many, many friends of Ireland across all levels of government and from you here in the Irish American communities has been essential, continues to be essential because we have unfinished business on the island of Ireland. Um, it's just one of the many examples of how Irish America and our friends have helped to shape us through our modern Irish history. And I think that that role has been well reflected and respected indeed in the decade of centenaries program. And I won't not refer to this year as the 60th anniversary of John F. Kennedy visiting. So there's a long <laughs> list of, uh, of moments, but to get back to the important subjects at hand, Dara, you think you're, I'm never going to wind up here. The decade of centuries does give us really, really an important moment where we can just look over our shoulder and reflect on how far we've come, but as well, and how much remains to be done. The country that I am deeply privileged to represent here is a very different country to the one that took that international step forward 100 years ago. 
I'm proud we're modern, I'm proud we're progressive, um, and I believe we're a much stronger nation for that. Uh, we're more equal, we're more diverse than ever before. And our friends on the global sta stage tell us that, uh, that they see us as stronger uh, because we're more diverse and inclusive. And I certainly believe we can tell our children that too, which is a really important message. And um, while history can often be, as I'm sure you'd admit here, a divisive subject, I believe that commemorations can actually present us with opportunities to remember together in a way that helps shape that next step and to remember it together in a way that can encourage and help us to value alternative and plural narratives and many perspectives on the same facts. The Decade of Centenaries program has really encouraged a deeper understanding of the context of the time, uh, looking at those different perspectives of our shared history and strengthening, I think, in, in some ways, certainly, peace and reconciliation on the island of Ireland. We've had a, a sort of a, a golden narrator, poet, philosopher uh, for the decade in our own president, Michael D. Higgins, who has made many wise reflections, and I highly recommend you all look at the Machna of 100 series of his presidential lectures. But I'll finish up quoting him here, where he says, commemoration itself can therefore be an important aspect of ethical remembering. Ethical remembering requires us to include those who may hitherto have been excluded from official formal accounts of history to shine a light on overlooked figures and actions in an attempt to have a more comprehensive and balanced perspective on the independence struggle. Um, I know that we've aimed for such a noble level of ambition, and we may hear in a moment um, uh, a little bit more about how we did. Um, uh, I, I want to acknowledge the really, truly magnificent work of historians, archivists, librarians, curators, and scholars across all the disciplines um, who have made this shared history accessible to us, and um, I think importantly engaging in the way they have um, with ordinary people, which I think has revealed some fresh and probably unexpected insights. It certainly gifted me, and I hope many people here with the richer understanding of the past. So um, our speaker, Dara Gannon tonight is a really a first class example, I have to say Dara, of how younger historians are today working uh, to shine fresh lights in places that we sometimes looked away from in the past. Um, I think that's a, a reflection of how those complexities and nuances in very recent history. My grandparents remember uh, 1916, so you know they're no longer alive, but there are generations now who, who are moving on who uh, really need the help of younger and deeper perspectives on what is a, a very recent journey. And your journey in mapping the Irish world, as it says here, from Washington um, to uh, Washington, Ireland, to London, Ireland, um, a really uh, critical uh, job uh, for which we are deeply grateful. Um, and I know that you're going to inspire, maybe provoke people tonight with uh, your thoughts on that no smaller challenge than mapping the world. So thank you very much, Dara, and thank you all for listening. Thank you, Ambassador Bernie Mason, for those wonderful remarks, which, you know, it's always difficult to follow you whenever you speak in terms of trying to address some of those issues, given the nuance and complexity to which you bring, uh, lend these subjects. Um, I'm really honoured and, and deeply privileged that you've uh, been available to speak this evening and to open today's um, event. Uh, doubly honoured, in fact, as has already been mentioned, not only as Ireland's ambassador to the United Nations, but as a fellow alumnus of Newth University, um, you know, I'm really privileged that we share the same stage uh, here today. Um, you may not remember, but we actually arrived in Washington, D.C. within about two weeks of each other. And in our opening conversation, uh, I think you mentioned the fact that you're still living in the honeymoon period of your time as ambassador. I gather over the last number of months, the honeymoon period is certainly over, given how busy your schedule has been. But please allow me to say on behalf of everyone here, and I can see how many representatives from the Washington Ireland community are here 
to extend our congratulations to you on your illustrious time here in DC so far, not only navigating the uh, extensive St. Patrick's season program, but the 25th year anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, and of course, President Biden's visit to the United to Ireland. So please, on behalf of the, the Irish uh, community here in DC, congratulations and thank you. I'm also really honored that Minister Jennifer Carol McNeil has uh, been able to attend uh, this evening. And I'm looking out at the, at the attendees this afternoon and for Colleen's suggestion, I guess I am in teaching mode, looking at attendance in the classroom. Um, I'm really just so honored and humbled that so many of you have taken the time to be here this evening, representing so many different organizations. I see Washington Ireland program here, Solis Nua, the Georgetown Global Irish Studies Initiative, the Department of History, evidently the embassy, my students, uh, the Fulbright community as well, among so many others. So I'm really honored and humbled that you would take the time to spend uh, with us this evening. Now, I should give you some, a little bit of background in terms of what this presentation will be um, about. Um, I was fortunate enough uh, in 2019, 2019 BC that is, 2019 BC being before COVID, to begin a project called uh, the Global Irish Revolution, which sought, as this presentation suggests, to map the events of 100 years ago from a global point of view. And because COVID intervened in my plan, and as you all know, so many plans, the United States was really the last leg of that journey, which I never really got to fulfill. And I was just really honored that the Fulbright program interceded in 2021 to offer me this scholarship or fellowship to take up uh, uh, a research program and to complete my research for my next book here uh, in Washington, D.C. Again, I'm really indebted to Professor Parsons for his generosity of time and thought in supporting my application and since my arrival here as well. So, so many debts of gratitude. Don't worry, you'll all get an acknowledgement in my next book, but I wanted to make sure to say it in person to you uh, while we had the opportunity. So let's begin. Of the 101 MPs elected to the Westminster Parliament in, uh, in, in December 1918, 29 took their seats on the 21st of January 1919 at the Mansion House in Dublin. Their assembly in the Irish capital was to fulfill the electoral promise of the Sinn Féin party, the political legatee of the 1916 Rising, that being the establishment of an independent Irish Republic. No day that ever dawned in Ireland had been waited for worked for, suffered for, like that January Tuesday, Sinn Féin supporter Moira Comerford reflected 50 years later. Now, the establishment of Dáil Éireann uh, was an exercise, I would argue, in the relocation of Irish political power. The establishment of the Dáil was a, uh, had been an over a half a century in the making. Nationalist politic politicians elected in Ireland had previously sat and voted as, at Westminster as the Irish Parliamentary Party in search of a limited form of self-government for Ireland, Home Rule. Standing before an audience of 1,000 in the round room, you can see some of the uh, figures pictured here to my right, the Sinn Féin members of Parliament, Parliament now presented themselves as Chakti Dala, or deputies of the Dáil. Rapturous applause from the galleries greeted their names as they were announced. Now, one absentee, of course, among many, was Countess Martinovich, who has previously been alluded to, the first female uh, MP and TD in the history of the United Kingdom. Uh, Countess Markovic wasn't there to confirm her attendance. She was sitting in an English prison. Nonetheless, proceeding in Irish, acting Prevara or Prime Minister Calabrua read the Declaration of Independence, ratifying the Irish Republic proclaimed in arms in 1916. The legislative powers of the revolutionary government comprising ministries of finance, foreign affairs, home affairs and defence were issued under the authority of a provisionally drafted Dáil Éireann constitution. A message to the free nations of the world seeking international recognition of the Irish Republic and a resolution to send delegates to the Paris Peace Conference were adopted by the Dáil Assembly. The city of Dublin, Moira Comerford reflected 50 years later, had been established as the centre of revolution. Now, the focus of the first doll in Irish historiography and state commemoration, I would argue, has further fixed the memory of Irish political sovereignty to that historical time and place. Studies of the so-called Irish democratic tradition have framed 21st of January 1919 as foundational. 
Writing on the occasion of the 75th anniversary, Brian Farrell asserted, quote, the first meeting of the first doll was a truly seminal moment for modern Irish political development. They were there to make history and they knew it. The centenary of the first doll in 2019, moreover, was marked with political re recreations at the Mansion House in Dublin, wherein the main Irish political parties born of the later civil war, Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael, bridged commemorative divisions to collectively claim 21st of January 1919. Dublin's Mansion House, therefore, continues to serve as a lieu de memoir to the Irish democratic tradition. Singular readings of the first doll, however, I would argue, can serve to reinforce an invented tradition. Doll Aaron was not the definitive forum of Irish constitutional debate or discussion during the revolutionary period. Between January 1919 and July 1921, the first doll met only 21 times, four of which were in public at the Mansion House. The proclamation of Dáil Éireann as an illegal assembly by the Dublin Castle authorities in September 1919 certainly undermined the reality of Dublin as Ireland's political capital. The establishment of the Department of Foreign Affairs in April of that year was intended as a counterweight to the British censor. Irish consulates and trade missions were established across continental Europe, Berlin, Madrid, Geneva, Stockholm, while emissaries were later sent to cities across the global south, Cape Town, Rio de Janeiro, New Delhi, to articulate Ireland's claim to independence. Ideas of Irish sovereignty, moreover, were discussed at length by Irish diaspora activists all over the world, notably at global Irish race conventions in Philadelphia and Melbourne in 1919, in Buenos Aires in 1921, and in Paris in 1922. So, Locating the epicenter of Irish nationalism between 1919 and 1923, I would argue, is not a case or an exercise in learned geography, but rather the exploration of an evolving transnational cartography. Mapping the coordinates of an Irish world in the post-war period, I would suggest, requires attention to contemporary alignments of space and time. As Orr Rosenboim has recently noted in the International History Review, quote, the interaction of geography and politics depends on the perception of space by policymakers. Space has no inherent political value. It is given value through political imagination. Spatiality necessarily reflects subjective value judgments, ideologies, and political aspirations, unquote. Temporal dynamics, I would suggest, must also be considered. Addressing a wide range of anti-colonial campaigns from the March 1st movement in Korea to the Waft Party in Egypt, Erez Manella has framed the immediate post-war period as a Wilsonian moment. Between the autumn of 1918 and the spring of 1919, according to Manella's influential formulation, Woodrow Wilson's vision of a new world order, self-determination, liberal democracy, collective security, became the catalyst for a wave of claims to national sovereignty worldwide. But did a Wilsonian moment sustain Irish nationalism? The political horizons of an Irish world this paper presents were consciously mapped and remapped by Irish revolutionaries in the post-war period through the effect of relocation of political authority and sovereign power beyond the island, Ireland's global territory. Framing territory as a conceptual space subject to contemporary nationalist reimagination, this paper examines Irish revolutionaries' strategic transfer of political sovereignty to global cities, capitalizing on extant geopolitical events, from the Versailles Peace Conference in 1919 to the Anglo-Irish Treaty Conference in 1921. Metropolitan centers beyond the island, I would suggest, were established as Irish identity spaces and decision spaces. Paris, Ireland. New York, Ireland, uh, Rome, Ireland, London, Ireland, with the view to securing international recognition of Irish sovereignty. It is imperative as we approach the end of the decade of centenaries, I would suggest that we explore new spaces for commemoration. After all, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. Now, beyond the trappings of independence on display in the Mansion House in Dublin, the flow of Irish political power was in fact directed away from Dublin 
floors the most global city in the world in 1919, Paris. The proceedings in Dublin were predicated on the immediate transfer of Irish political authority to Paris. The message to the free nations of the world, for example, was a Francophile document written, performed, and published for consumption by the political elites at the Paris Peace Conference. The message, in fact, had first been composed in French by George Gavin Duffy before being translated into Irish and English in preparation for the first doll. The language of Wilsonianism, moreover, was utilized throughout the document. The clarity and cogency of the message further allowed for an international readership and additional foreign language translation. Fellow Sinn Féin TD, Shanti O'Kelly, who's pictured here in the center, along with George Gavin Duffy and Marie Gavin Duffy, enjoying their afternoon in Paris, uh, would later remark of preparations for the issue of this and founding documents. Quote, there was a general anxiety to get the doll into existence as soon as possible in view of the meeting of the Paris Peace Conference, unquote. As Avion Rochefam has observed of ethnic nationalism and empire, quote, the trappings of political sovereignty often come within the reach of nationalists suddenly and unexpectedly under extraordinary and short-lived circumstances arising from a regional or global crisis rather than strictly international developments. If not grasped immediately, the opportunity to establish a separate polity may not recur for generations." O'Kelly himself was delegated by the Dáil to journey to Paris with the view to securing admission to Versailles for Eamon de Valera or Arthur Griffith, then still imprisoned in British jails. Uh, and because of this, he was invested with discretionary powers by the Dáil as envoy of the provisional government to secure recognition of the Irish Republic. Now, crucially to the argument of this presentation, Dáil Éireann would not reconvene until the 1st of April, 1919. So three months after the first meeting of the first Dáil. So in the spring of 1919, I would argue, Paris, not Dublin, was the space in which Irish sovereignty was effectively governed. Above all, Arthur Griffith counseled from prison, concentrate on the peace conference. Now, the political authority of the Irish Republic was effectively governed from the fifth floor of Le Grand Hotel. And as you can imagine, they spared no expense. Le Grand Hotel had been established during the rule of Napoleon III and had become synonymous with political royalty, guests ranging from Tsar Nicholas II to the Shah of Iran. To this list of sovereigns was added Shanti O'Kelly. O'Kelly was joined in this mission, uh, most prominently by George Gavin Duffy, who arrived from Dublin in April. Paris is still the capital of Europe, he would write to Eamon de Valera. It is the most international meeting ground. There is no censorship and comparative liberty of speech and genuine traditional sympathy for Ireland, unquote. But negotiating the halls and mirrors of diplomatic society required cultural mediation and social standing. In March, the English-born Italian writer of Jewish descent, Annie Vivanti, who's pictured here, joined the Paris delegation, and she lent her considerable cultural cachet, rather, to the cause of the Irish Republic. She was a poet, she was a writer, she was also very closely tied to the Italian delegation. Ironically, however, Vivanti had never been to Ireland in her life and would never actually visit Ireland before she died. But she was inspired by the Sinn Féin movement, writing, there is nothing I would not gladly do to be of use to the country I have never seen and yet love so much. Vivanti's credentials opened up new doors to the Irish mission. Um, she wrote letters, for example, to high level officials, arranging interviews with high, high level diplomats, and she also undertook visits to the Italian delegation. O'Kelly would write back to Dublin with glee. She is well in with some of the very biggest of her home country folk here, and already has had interesting conversations with some of them. Now, Annie Vivanti was neither born in Ireland nor elected to Dáil Éireann, yet she would become an invaluable member of the Paris delegation. Written out of the Irish history books for the last 100 years, she can be considered, in my forthcoming book, one of Ireland's global influencers. The Irish representatives in Paris were like many other nation states in waiting expectant of Woodrow Wilson's vision of a post-World world, world War order and expectant of his power of delivery. However, Wilson studiously avoided O'Kelly in the uh, corridors of power in Paris. 
And this underlying, I would suggest, the real politic at play here in Paris uh, and the great power negotiations at play, moreover. In his study of the Wilsonian moment, Erez Manella has commented of contemporary understandings of Wilsonianism, quote, the story of the Wilsonian moment uh, in the colonial world is about the role of power. Power, both real and perceived, is dissemination, adoption, and operationalization. The power politics inherent in Wilsonianism were quickly understood and applied by the Irish delegation in Paris. After Wilson's failure to acknowledge Kelly O'Kelly's first proposal, as you can see, O'Kelly didn't make it past the front door at Versailles, so he had to uh, adopt alternative methods. And he subsequently issued a copy of the proposals to the international press. He wrote to Dublin, I am satisfied that the only way to approach Wilson is to tackle him boldly and publicly and to get for the matter all the publicity possible. Those here on the spot in Paris who know Wilson best fully and heartily endorse my view." Unquote. So this was not the deference to Wilsonian internationalism uh, and moral diplomacy, which we heard at the Mansion House in January 1919, but rather a demonstration of Irish smart power, as dictated by great power diplomacy at Versailles. A subsequent letter from O'Kelly and Gavin Duffy to French Premier George Clemenceau, which you can see in this slide, reaffirmed their authority to act on behalf of the Irish Republic in the proceedings of the conference and to enter into agreements and sign treaties. So the Irish delegates in Paris, according to O'Kelly and Gavin Duffy, were in effect penitentiaries. Of course, news trickled back to Dublin about what was happening in Paris. The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Khan Plunkett, issued a very detailed report to his fellow TDs. I'll read it now. Shanti O'Kelly was sent out and has gathered around him a little group to put the case of Ireland, not merely to France, but to the other countries concerned for peace with liberty. Of the work to be done in this connection and the obstacles to be faced, the ordinary newspaper reader can form no idea." Unquote. So just the comprehensive nature of the report to the doll. And this again lends weight to the idea that O'Kelly and Gavin Duffy were effectively acting um, on devolved power from Dáil Éireann, rather than reporting directly and repeatedly back for authorization in Dublin. Um, and this, of course, was met with confusion on the floor of Dáil Éireann. Uh, for example, the TD for Tipperary North, Joseph McDonough, asked of Plunkett, understandably, who are the officials or employees working under Shanti O'Kelly and George Gavin Duffy? Who appointed them? And what precautions were taken as to their fitness before they were appointed? A legitimate question. O'Kelly's powers, as Plunkett's statement indicated, were enabled by the Dáil leadership. Reports received from the Paris mission by the Dáil cabinet between April and June were simply marked as red with no response minuted. Writing to O'Kelly following his election as president of Dáil Éireann, Eamon de Valera emphasized the sovereign authority of the Irish representatives in Paris. Quote, keep us in as constant touch as you can with your doings. You have, of course, wide discretionary powers for acting on your own initiative. So recognition of the Irish Republic, I would suggest, rested on the political influence of its representatives in Paris and not in Dublin. The most effective strategy the Irish representatives in Paris proposed was the leveraging of Irish-American influence over Woodrow Wilson, principally through the Friends of Irish Freedom. The FOIF, who had been established in New York in advance of the 1916 Rising, had become the recognized face of the Irish nationalist movement in the United States by 1919, counting on over 10,000 members. Covertly, however, the organization was controlled by veteran Fenian John Devoy and the rising star in New York democratic politics, Judge Daniel Gohalin. In March 1919, the FOIF appointed a three-person delegation, the American Commission on Irish Independence, to visit Paris and to secure admittance to the peace conference. This commission was a select group of the most reputable Irish Americans on the scene. Frank P. Walsh, for example, the leader of the delegation, was a labor lawyer and former joint chairman of the Lower Labor Conference Board. Edward Dunn, the former mayor of Chicago, no less, while Michael J. Ryan had previously been president of the United Irish League of America. These three gentlemen, O'Kelly argued, were persons of importance and influence from the American political 
point of view. It would be difficult even for President Wilson to refuse to see them. How prescient. The influence of the American Commission on Irish independence in the spring of 1919 would be felt not in New York, not in Dublin, but in Paris. Writing on the 1st of March, Wilson's private secretary, Joseph Hamilty, advised the president, quote, during the past few days, men of all races have come to me, urging me to request you to see this committee, unquote. Within seven days of their arrival in Paris, the commission had an interview with Wilson and given access to the American delegation at Versailles. Meetings of British Prime Minister David Lloyd George were further arranged. Their work has been as fruitful and successful as one could expect under the circumstances, O'Kelly wrote, with satisfaction. Irish political influence in Paris, however, would dissipate on their departure from Dublin. Arriving in Dublin on the 4th of May, the American Commission were given a 10-day tour of Ireland, uh, culminating in an official address to Dáil Éireann, which led to some belligerent language, shall we say as follows. They stated to the Dáil TDs, you have pledged yourselves to follow in the footsteps of the 1916 leaders, and most of you are as eager as they are to die." Unquote. So such belligerent rhetoric in the context of the Versailles Peace Conference evidently was ill-advised. Returning to Paris in mid-May, the Commission now found the doors of the American de delegation and the window of opportunity at the Peace Conference closed to them. Meeting the Commission privately, Wilson admonished them for having left Paris. Quote, we are well on our way to getting Mr. de Valera and his associates over here, when you made it so difficult by your speeches in Ireland that we could not do it, unquote. Ireland, Wilson concluded, had proven, quote, the great metaphysical tragedy of the day. So, to reflect, between January and June 1919, Paris, not Dublin, was the epicenter of the Irish world. Paris was a decision space of Ireland, wherein Irish sovereignty was projected and protected by activists, some of whom were neither born in Ireland nor elected to Dáil Éireann. Paris, in fact, was conceived by contemporaries and can be more accurately understood by historians as a temporal territorial extension of the imagined Irish community, Paris, Ireland. So how can we commemorate Ireland's early engagements with the international community, which you've just heard. As the ambassador has aptly noted earlier, September 23 marks the centenary of Ireland's admittance to the League of Nations. And I would suggest that a traveling exhibition documenting the transnational activism of Irish nationalists, which you've heard about today, would offer both an appropriate, but also an accessible lieu de memoir by which to remember the voices of Irish activists beyond the island. The past, after all, is a foreign country, they do things differently there. By the summer of 1919, however, the governors of Irish sovereignty in Paris recognized that their global moment had passed. We are of the opinion that it will be useful if you could go to the United States as soon as it is known that we have been turned down here, John Dio Kelly wrote to Eamon de Valera. All hope of achieving anything through the peace conference has vanished. Jurisdiction over Irish sovereignty was thereafter transferred from Paris, Ireland, Ireland to New York, Ireland. On the 23rd of June, 1919, the American-born president of the Irish Republic, Eamon de Valera, was unveiled at a press conference at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel on New York's Fifth Avenue. And as you can see from the image behind me, it was a global media event. Over a thousand journalists, in fact, thronged the historic gallery to get a picture of the president of the Irish Republic, the revolutionary president of the Irish Republic, who had escaped from a British prison only months prior. Reflecting on de Valera's New York, New York premiere, IRB envoy to the US, Patrick McCarthy, suggested that the Friends of Irish Freedom had in fact styled de Valera as president of the Republic of Ireland. He thereafter assumed that title and the press conceded it to him. And it's very often suggested that this president of the Irish Republic is really given to de Valera in this American context. He's no longer Prevara or prime minister, he becomes president, which has a greater resonance in the United States. And of course, de Valera was an American born, and it's the, you know, the dream of every young person in America to become president. So in some respects, he's living out his childhood dream. And this is reinforced by the media at that time. Meetings in his Waldorf Hotel suite were characterized by New York publications as interviews with the president of the Irish Republic in the Irish White House, for example. 
Indeed, the international celebrity of De Valera attracted the publicists of Madison Avenue. In July, he was approached by the nation's forum record label to contribute to its celebrated Great Speeches LP series. So surprisingly, and somewhat shockingly, De Valera becomes a recording artist in 1919, uh, recording three speeches in the nation's forum 38th Street studio, joining John D. Rockefeller and Franklin D. Roosevelt among America's foremost contemporary recording artists, available on Spotify. Offers of up to $50,000, meanwhile, were made from New York directors for the motion picture rights to De Valera's life, leading to drafts of the screenplay and discussions of a potential acting career. So New York City, in reality, made the president of, of the Irish Republic political box office. And this is noted back in Paris, where this global moment has passed. Um, George Gavin Duffy writes to De Valera on hearing of the news, Heartiest congratulations on your phenomenal success in the States. We are watching the American campaign with the keenest interest. There is nothing of doing here. So this note from George Gavin Duffy again signifies the decisive transfer of authority over Irish sovereignty from Paris to New York. The flow of Irish political power in the United States further was legitimated by the nationalist leadership in Dublin. It is there, Arthur Griffith acknowledged to the doll, that the center of gravity of the whole political situation is for the present fixed. And it's quite remarkable what follows in the context of contemporary Ireland and our understanding of Dáil Éireann and TD's constituency roles and representation, representative politics. Um, not only would approval be granted for consulates in New York, Chicago, New Orleans, San Francisco and Boston, but seven elected TDs from Dáil Éireann moved to the United States for 18 months to spend time with De Valera in support of Irish self-determination. So again, totally in contradistinction, perhaps, to our understanding today of democratic politics. One of those, of course, is Harry Boland. Uh, and Harry Boland writes to Shanti O'Kelly from New York, you will quite understand that we on the spot here in New York know exactly the right thing to do. And you may rest assured that it will be done. Our work begins. So it's this sense of, a transfer of authority uh, from Paris to New York. Now, the American mission's aims were threefold, to cultivate public, present, public interest in America in support of the Irish cause, to generate financial support uh, across the US for the nationalist movement, and to secure recognition of the Irish Republic by the US government. The central space of Manhattan in particular foregrounded public interest in the Irish cause. On the 10th of July, 1919, the Friends of Irish Freedom uh, hosted Eamon de Valera at a sold out Madison Square Garden, the poster you can see behind me. 15,000 people packed MSG to see the President of the Irish Republic, more than the Knicks get today. Sorry, I had to say that. While a further 10,000 waited outside, bring the traffic to a standstill. De Valera's arrival on stage, in fact, was met with a 10 minute standing ovation. This, he proclaimed, is New York's recognition of the Irish Republic. De Valera's later award of the freedom of the city on the 17th of January, 1920, further bestowed him a civic respectability and political citizenship, which belied his otherwise revolutionary career. After all, only two months earlier, the then Prince of Wales had similarly been afforded the freedom of the city. In the fall of 1919, De Valera had planned to undertake a bond drive in the US to support the continuing functioning of the skeleton dollar and government in Dublin. And here, once again, it's Irish American networks which were vital. Familiar with the American financial system, Daniel Kohalan, whose picture just to the left of De Valera, um, advised that a Republican bond drive would in fact contravene US blue sky laws, which protected the American public from fraudulent investment during this period. And this uh, fact was reinforced by the Wall Street Journal who commented, sold as bonds, the De Valera issue is nothing more or less than a swindle, unquote. So they didn't mince words. So creatively, they decided not to sell the Republican bond, but to sell Republican bond certificates. And so circumvent the legal uh, quagmire that would have been uh, a consequence. And again, this is buttressed by the FOIF's legal connections in the city of New York. The drive was launched, for example, with the endorsement of 40,000 New York State solicitors. Um, and New York subscribers alone would contribute 
almost $1.5 million, that's $20 million in today's money to the Republican loan. So really quite remarkable. Community institutions such as schools, parish halls, and political clubs served as respectable assembly points for the sale of these bond certificates. While professionals such as city judges, uh, officials and lawyers attended meetings from Brooklyn to Queens. So Irish American nationalists were instrumental in the raising of the Republican loan. Now, New York, moreover, served as a, a node or a connecting point for the coordination of Irish appeals to political power here in Washington, DC, very much under the auspices of the Friends of Irish Freedom. Now, there is a bit of a tension here, it should be stated, between Irish aspirations and Irish American aspirations. The Friends of Irish Freedom, while wanting an Irish Republic, were also hell-bent on defeating the passing of uh, League of Nations legislation in the American Senate, believing this legislation to be un-American. Uh, and in this respect, Friends of Irish Freedom leader, Judge Daniel Kohalan, who we met a moment ago, would move from political events in New York to Washington, D.C., where he and other Irish American leaders spoke at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee denouncing the League of Nations, but proclaiming the, in favor of an Irish Republic. And De Valera, of course, doesn't know whether to stick or twist. He needs their support, but he also wants to uh, get recognition from Woodrow Wilson. And the League of, Nation, League of Nations is Wilson's ideal. The defeat of the League of Nations legislation in the US Senate in November of that year was ultimately claimed by New York Friends of Irish Freedom members as a milestone victory. But I want to also turn to someone who's not, again, written into the history books, uh, but who was very much a presence here in Washington, DC on behalf of the Irish Republic. So the Friends of Irish Freedom moved the center of their operations from New York to Washington, DC in the fall of 1919. And they create what's called the Irish National Bureau, which is set up on the 10th floor of the Muncie building, which has since been destroyed is my understanding, but it was at 1329 E Street Northwest. So just blocks away from the White House. And central to the operations of the Irish National Bureau was this woman here, Catherine Hughes, who became its de facto president. She published its weekly newsletter, which you can see this I received from the National Archives in DC, which by 1920 was received by over 300 US congressmen. Hughes consequently was invited to address the US Senate on Ireland, which led to a passing of a resolution in support of Irish self-determination. And just like Annie Vivanti before her, Catherine Hughes written out of Irish history books uh, pretty much, despite the fact that she was a visible and influential presence here on the streets of Washington DC on behalf of Ireland. New York, nonetheless, remained the swing state to securing recognition of the Irish Republic in the US. The endorsement of the New York leadership De Valera calculated would be invaluable in leveraging the president, sorry, the Republican and Democratic parties ahead of the American presidential election in 1920. But those tensions, which I mentioned earlier, between Irish and Irish American leaders would again rise to the surface. Divisions between De Valera and Cohalan over the Friends of Irish Freedom's opposition to the League of Nations and De Valera's controversial New York Globe interview in which he made the case for British recognition of Irish independence on similar lines to Cuba's relationship to the US was met with a disastrous political split. Whereat the Republican convention in Chicago in June of 1920, Kohalan successfully lobbied to secure a plank at the Republican party convention in favor of Irish self-determination. Not to be upstaged, however, de Valera, president of the Irish Republic, who had increasingly taken to call himself the chief, decided that he would raise a rival resolution asking for official recognition of the Irish Republic. Unwilling to support rival resolutions and fed up with the Irish uh, arguing sides, the Republican Party dropped both resolutions ahead of their convention and ultimately ended the possibility of gaining recognition for the Irish Republic. Big as this country is, Eamon de Valera, de Valera later remarked ruefully, it is obviously not big enough to hold the judge and myself, unquote. De Valera's eventual return to Ireland in December 1920 marked his political separation from New York, Ireland and the power politics of Irish American nationalism. To paraphrase the historian Joe Lee, no New York, no Washington DC, no recognition of the Irish Republic. So to reflect, 
Between June 1919 and June 1920, New York and Washington DC were effectively the centers of the Irish world. DC and NYC were Irish decision spaces. They were also Irish identity spaces, wherein Irish sovereignty was projected and protected by activists, again, many of whom were neither born in Ireland nor elected to Dáil Éireann. These cities, again, were conceived by contemporaries and could be more accurately understood by historians as temporal territorial extensions of an imagined Irish community, New York, Ireland, and Washington, Ireland. So how can we commemorate Ireland's attempts to secure international recognition in the US? June 2024, in fact, marked the centenary of the formal opening of diplomatic relations between Ireland and America. And I would suggest that in keeping with the work of, for example, Catherine Hughes, which again has gone undocumented in Irish history books to date, that we might think about, for example, the erection of historic plaques in the district, which documents sites where Irish nationalists such as Catherine Hughes had been so active, visibly active, working for international recognition. And these would, of course, constitute visible sites of public memory or sites of memory to Irish activism beyond the island. As I said earlier, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. We now transition to Rome as our penultimate visit. Now, Shanti O'Kelly had moved from Paris to Rome and he communicated to De Valera back in New York, stating, there is no doubt that Rome has increased importance, diplomatically speaking, in the summer of 1920. In fact, O'Kelly's letter to De Valera in the summer of 1920 was the fifth letter to De Valera, arguing for greater representation at the Vatican. Underlying this urgency was the widely held belief that the British Foreign Office was exerting immense pressure on the Vatican to issue a denunciation of the Irish nationalist movement. I'm satisfied, however, O'Kelly would write, that if the Vatican issues a manifesto against the Irish uh, doll, it will raise a storm of violent protests around the Catholic world. Our people will take all possible steps to have the Catholics of America, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and South Africa to join them in a former protest to the Vatican, which the latter body could not afford to ignore. O'Kelly was thereafter hurriedly instated as diplomatic agent of the Republic on the orders of de Valera in New York, who said, I have little knowledge of the politics of the different Vatican groups, and I will have to depend upon you to supply my lack of knowledge. Dublin's distance from the realities of these international movements is again in evidence on the floor of Dáil Éireann. Addressing the Assembly in August 1920, Count Plunkett, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, informed the deputies that for some time, Mr. Sean Hugh Kelly had been successfully combating English intrigues in Rome, which prompted Connemara TD, Porra Gamalia, to ask what likelihood there was Mr. Sean Hugh Kelly would return to take up his duties as Secretary of the Gaelic League, unquote. The battle for Irish political legitimacy was centered now on Rome. And O'Kelly was in fact only superseded in power and influence by the somewhat formidable figure of the rector of the Irish College, Monsignor John Hagen, again today written out effectively of the Irish history books because he was not a member of the elected Dáil Éireann. Trained as a priest in County Carlow, Hagen was transferred to the Irish College in 1904, serving 15 years before his appointment to the position of rector in 1919. Intensely interested in Sinn Féin, his nationalist outlook was well advanced in, before the arrival of Sean T. O'Kelly. Now, Irish nationalists' attempt to offset British diplomatic pressure was made possible by a global Irish presence in Rome. 1920, somewhat fortuitously, was the ad limina year for English-speaking Catholic bishops to arrive at the Vatican. Among Hagen's most distinguished guests of the Irish College that summer were the Archbishop of Boston, Cardinal O'Connell, and the Archbishop of Sydney, Michael O'Kelly, with whom O'Kelly discussed politics in the sanctuary of the Irish College. And it's really apropos, I think, that we're speaking about Monsignor Hagen and the Irish College in Rome, because for those of you who are unaware, Professor, uh, Professor Parsons here has been instrumental in acquiring the papers of Hagen and the Irish College in Rome for Georgetown University Special Collections. So those are now available to you students and scholars here at Georgetown 
uh, in digitized form. So this is what makes these kind of discussions possible. Also amplifying what the ambassador said earlier about the importance of archivists, curators, and so on to our decade of centenaries. As the document on my right suggests, on the 23rd of May, 1920, the Vatican marked the beatification of Oliver Plunkett at St. Peter's Basilica. The Archbishop of Armagh had been hanged in London in 1681 for promoting the, Ro uh, the Roman faith as part of an alleged papist plot. Now, over 100,000 people gathered in St. Peter's Square to celebrate his beatification. Among them, a Sinn Féin delegation invited by O'Kelly as a very transgressive act, including the Lord Mayor of Dublin and the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Count Plunkett. But it was the Rome-based, non-elected Monsignor Hagen, pictured here, who stole the show. He presented gifts of a highly political nature to the Pope, Pope Benedict XV, during the ceremony, including a tricolored bouquet of flowers. Now, we have to remember at this time, by the way, the tricolor is a revolutionary uh, flag, for example. It was created by Sinn Féin after the Rising. We now associate it with our national flag in Ireland. But at this time, this was a transgressive act, uh, especially at the Vatican. O'Kelly, meanwhile, had designs on turning the beatification into an entire Irish National Week in Rome. More power to him. 18 members of the International Catholic Church, among them Cardinal O'Connell of Boston and Archbishop Hamel of San Francisco, were invited by O'Kelly to attend a reception at the Grand Hotel where the revolutionary Irish national anthem, Arlo and Levine, was sung. And again, Arlo and Levine, the soldier's song, a revolutionary song, then our national anthem now. So can you imagine how transgressive this is at the Vatican? These transgressive acts of Irish nationalism in Rome drew, Rome drew the attention of the Holy See. And in an unprecedented diplomatic move, Pope Benedict XV invited Shanti O'Kelly, again, a revolutionary in fact, to an audience at the Apostolic Palace on the 26th of June. Over the course of an hour, the Pope discussed his pleasure with the beatification ceremony before turning to the somewhat uncomfortable events of Irish Week. During an extensive interrogation, Benedict XV inquired as to what had taken place at O'Kelly's reception. Of course, the fact that Ira on the vein is sung Askelga meant that the Pope was really relying on Sean O'Kelly to provide a, a suitable translation. So there's obviously a bit of political obfuscation going on here in the lyrics, I suggest. Um, but O'Kelly evidently met his, uh, or assuaged his concerns. He said he was glad to have all the information, stating, I know what to say to those people who are trying to make trouble. Quote. He was referring to the British Foreign Office. A month earlier, the British Foreign Secretary, Arthur Balfour, had visited the Vatican in an attempt to press Benedict XV to pass a, 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 a denunciation of the Irish nationalist movement. And British diplomatic pressure would continue again from the autumn of 1920. For example, the hunger strike of Terence McSweeney between August and October 1920 led to discussions of a potential condemnation of the immorality of hunger striking at the Vatican. Monsignor Hagen, however, uh, pushed again to push back against British influence. He invited the Archbishop of Perth, Patrick Clune, to visit Rome in January 1921. Clune had just returned from Ireland, where he had undertaken a tour of the country. He had just met British Prime Minister David Lloyd George in London to discuss a truce. And most significantly, he was able to detail the violence of the British Crown forces. His own nephew had been killed at uh, Dublin Castle on Bloody Sunday. A few months later, meanwhile, the Archbishop of Melbourne, Daniel Mannix, arrived in Rome to prevent before, present before the Holy See. Um, and Mannix had been on a tour of the United States and the United Kingdom and was considered a significant danger or threat to the British establishment by members of their government. He had an extended meeting with Benedict XV in which he outlined the arguments against issuing this foregone conclusion, which many believed, of a denunciation of the Irish nationalist movement. And he urged a request, or rather requested the Pope, Benedict XV, to mediate in the conflict through a charitable donation to the Irish White Cross. Mannix and Hagen together were subsequently asked by Benedict XV to draft an open letter to accompany the donation, interceding for peace in Ireland. Their letter, in the name of the Pope, was sub substantially that, that which was published in the international press on the 22nd of May, effectively calling for a truce. So again, you have these non dollaran elected TDs advocating for Ireland um, from beyond the island. 
And this is acknowledged in the floor of Dollar and by the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Kant Plunkett, who acknowledges the significance of the Archbishop Mannix's role um, in the Vatican. So to reflect, between June 1920 and July 1921, Rome was the epicenter of the Irish world. Rome was an Irish decision space. It was also an Irish identity space where Irish sovereignty was projected and protected by activists, many of whom, like Mannix, were not elected, for example, to Dáil Éireann. Rome was conceived by contemporaries and could be more accurately understood by us historians as a temporal, territorial extension of an imagined community, Rome, Ireland. So how can we commemorate Ireland's relationship with the Vatican uh, during this period? Well, as I suggested earlier, I think one of the most important things we can do as scholars is to disseminate our work, and which the ambassador mentioned, to the ordinary person who will now have access to original primary source materials relating to this period. And because of the digitization of efforts here at Georgetown University, the materials which I've referred to from the Irish College in Rome, which document for the first time really, the interventions of people like Archbishop Mannix um, and others will be available to the Irish Republic. And hopefully we conceptualize our understanding of who was an activist on behalf of Ireland 100 years ago. Finally, we are going to turn our attention to London, Ireland. And you can see this familiar picture, picture Collins, who's in the center, uh, suitably in motion on his way into 10 Downing Street for the uh, treaty negotiations. By July 1921, the War of Independence had reached a bloody stalemate. A military truce between the representatives of the British Crown Forces and the Irish Republican Army would come into effect on the 11th of July. Unwilling to officially recognize the Irish Republic, David Lloyd George carefully offered to convene a conference in London to discuss a political resolution. On the 11th of October, 1921, Irish plenipotentiaries entered 10 Downing Street with powers to negotiate the constitutional relationship of Ireland with the British Empire. They would remain in London for two months. Now sending a delegation for such a protracted period, again, I would argue, is indicative of the Dáil cabinet's effective devolution of power to activists beyond the island, not at home in Dublin. And this is actually represented in the personnel who moved from Dublin to London for that extensive two month period. And again, away from constituency service or their roles as ministers around the cabinet table in Dublin, some of whom you can see in this picture. The Dáil delegation comprised three of the seven Dáil cabinet ministers, Arthur Griffith, Michael Collins and Robert Barton. Two further Dáil Aaron TDs, Eamon Duggan and George Gavin Duffy, while the plenipotentiaries were joined by two Dáil Aaron directors of publicity, Erskine Childers and Desmond Fitzgerald, and the Dáil's permanent secretary, Jeremy O'Hegarty. So in respect of political experience and political office, I would argue that the London delegation that negotiated the Anglo-Irish Treaty matched the American delegation coordinated by de Valera in America in 1970. Substantial expertise experience moving from Dublin to these other cities to effectively negotiate sovereignty on behalf of Ireland. Now, most of you will be aware that Irish history books are replete with the refrain, why did de Valera not go to London? Okay. Many of you will have answers. We'll leave that to Q&A. Uh, it's quite a political question. But I would ask a different question, perhaps. Why did any Irish plenipotentiaries go to London? The issue of the convening of talks in London, in fact, was raised by leading contemporaries. I was against their ever going to England, Minister for Defence Cal Brewer said, after the treaty had been signed. I said this conference should be held in a neutral country. I realised before they went over the terrible influence that would be brought upon them. Sean Etchingham, the Minister for Fisheries, similarly stated to the Dáil after the fact, quote, I did not like the scene in London. I firmly believe they would not have signed it in Dublin. It is a tragedy, unquote. I would argue that it was the political and cultural status attributed to Irish representatives in the capital of empire, London, which in part explains their reason and rationale for agreeing to go to London as plenipotentiaries. And this is actually explained by many anti-treaty activists during the, uh, during the treaty debates. Mary McSweeney, who was vociferously anti-treaty 
stated, when you sent the delegates to London, this did not directly or indirectly constitute a compromise. We believed, conversely, it would show the world the justice of our cause, unquote. De Valera, the most vociferous opponent of the settlement, argued similarly in favor of going to London. Quote, they wanted the plenipotentiaries to give the world the impression that they were sent over with full powers. The world would see that they were offering no obstacle to negotiation, unquote. So my argument here is that the presence of Irish negotiators in London, rather than in Dublin, was intended to secure international recognition for the Irish Republic as a legitimate, respectable, and serious political movement. In fact, similar to his advice to Shanti O'Kelly in Paris two years earlier, de Valera had advised the plenipotentiaries they would have the fullest freedom possible. So there is this consistency between 1919 and 1921. As a point as of an example here, Arthur Griffith, who led the delegation, returned to Dublin only twice in two months. Tensions, however, would again recur across the Irish Sea over the issue of actual power. Dublin is the real problem, Michael Collins wrote to Griffith in October 1921. They know what we are doing, but I don't know exactly the state of the Dubliners' activities. The British cabinet further were fully aware of the divisions between London and Dublin, a tension which David Lloyd George sought to exploit, as Collins himself acknowledged. Not much achieved, principally because the Prime Minister recognises our overriding difficulty, Dublin. Plays on this. So the political and geographical distance between London and Dublin, I would argue, had the effect of isolating Collins and Griffith from de Valera and Dublin. Griffith and I had a lonely meeting, Collins wrote one evening. We came to the topic for the thousandth time of the Dubliners. Ensconced at 10 Darling Street, the Irish plenipotentiaries would write exasperatedly to de Valera back in Dublin, rebuking his attempt to try to intervene in negotiations from across the Irish Sea. London, not Dublin, was the centre of Irish nationalism. Crucially, at a fractious dull debate on the 3rd of December, the issue of the London-Dublin divide was brought into focus. The London delegation and the Dublin cabinet members agreed in principle on the establishment of an Irish free state, the requisite for an oath of fidelity to the British state and the introduction of a boundary commission to resolve the issue of partition. What remained unclear, however, was which group would resolve the issue and decide on the settlement, the London or the Dublin representatives. In the final moments, before the plenipotentiaries rushed, rushed to get the overnight boats across the Irish Sea, de Valera confirmed that they had full powers to sign an agreement, but to sign nothing before referring back to Dublin. The Anglo-Irish Treaty, as we all know, was signed in London in the early hours of the 6th of December, 1921. The decision of the plenipotentiaries not to refer back to the Dáil cabinet before signing has generated effectively a century of controversy. However, the view of Griffith and Collins and other plenipotentiaries was essentially the same world view. London, not Dublin, was a decision space of Irish nationalism. Just like the negotiations developed with sovereign powers in previous global cities, Paris, New York, Washington DC and Rome, London was now considered the political territory of Irish nationalists. And as with political negotiations, the all TDs in Dublin were simply unaware of the realities of political negotiation on the ground. Amid the welter of arguments and counter arguments over the terms of the treaty, the absence of political accountability on the part of Irish political representatives abroad was a resonant critique. The plenipotentiaries, opponents of the treaty argued, had simply failed to acknowledge Dáil Éireann, in effect, as the real decision space of Irish political sovereignty. In the final vote, which followed the treaty debates back now at the Mansion House on the 7th of January 1922, Dáil Éireann TDs endorsed the Anglo-Irish Treaty by 64 votes to 57. Political governance over Irish political sovereignty, which had devolved to metropolitan centres beyond Ireland in the preceding three years, was eventually returned to the control of Dáil Éireann in Dublin. This sense of international political conclusion was captured deeply by the New York Times when it said, quote, whether in Paris or in New York, sensible Irishmen must be aware 
that the final test of their capacity to govern themselves is now upon them. So to reflect, as the uh, ambassador has stated, April 23 marks the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. We are allowed to have commemorations beyond centenaries. Uh, it should be noted that April 2024 also marks 75 years of the establishment of the Republic of Ireland by law next year. And I would argue in the context of a shared past, shared future, which we've heard about earlier today, that it is surely time that in respect of our education in the Irish uh, education system, that our understanding of key events like the Anglo-Irish Treaty can be understood from both Irish and British political contexts. Uh, to understand the Anglo-Irish Treaty, much like the Anglo-Irish Agreement 70 plus years later, we must understand both Irish history and British history. And it's in education that I believe that shared past, shared future can have greatest promise. So to conclude, on the 16th of January, 1922, Michael Collins arrived at Dublin Castle to receive the keys of the British administration in Ireland from the Lord Lieutenant. The lowering of the British Union flag and the raising of the Irish tricolour in the centre of Dublin marked the symbolic handover of power from the British regime to the new Irish Free State. State commemorations at Dublin Castle in January 2022 have again reinforced Dublin as the central lieu de mémoire of the Irish Revolution, creating a line of commemorative continuity between January 2019 and January 2022. 100 years earlier, however, as we've discussed, the imagined community of the Irish nation and its sovereign power extended well beyond the political space of the Irish capital. Between January 1919 and 22, Irish nationalists transferred power and authority over sovereignty of the Irish Republic beyond the territorial limitations of the island. The legitimacy of the Irish Republic was underwritten by Irish nationalists in Paris, New York, Rome, and London. Key decisions on the political development of Irish nationalism were made in these global cities, and very often by governors of Irish national sovereignty who were either neither born in Ireland nor elected to Dáil Éireann. Annie Vivanti in Paris, Daniel Cohalan in New York, Catherine Hughes in Washington, D.C., Archbishop Daniel Mannix in Rome. These global influencers intervened successfully on behalf of the Irish Republic. Irish political power, I would argue, in conclusion, was strategically transferred across transnational spaces during the revolutionary period in accordance with contemporary geopolitical outlook and worldview, in line with what many scholars suggest is a broader experimentation with sovereignty in the post-war period. From the Versailles Peace Conference in 1919 to the Anglo-Irish Treaty Conference in 1921, Irish revolutionaries devolved political authority and power to Paris, Ireland, New York, Ireland, Washington, Ireland, Rome, Ireland, and London, Ireland. These were the decision spaces of the Irish world. And again, I think this is imperative to understand in terms of our understanding of global moments across the post-war period. The past, after all, is a foreign country. They do things differently there. So where do we go from here? A century after the facts, the geography of the Irish Revolution remains open to historical research, debate, and commemoration. In this evening's lecture, I propose four, propose four lieu de memoir, or spaces or sites of memory, to mark the legacies of the global Irish Revolution in the fields of museums, memorialization, archives, and education. Other proposals, I hope, will come from the scholars, policymakers, and students here in the room. Public engagement, ultimately, with the Irish Decade of Centenaries has been historic. It has reached untold people, new populations, and new communities. But it need not be purely historic. History must have a place, indeed places, in Irish collective memory beyond 2023. As the inscription outside the National Archives on Pennsylvania Avenue reads, what is past is prologue. Thank you. Um, I think Dara will take a few questions, maybe 10 minutes, because um, there's a bottle of wine sitting out there with our name. Um, but we'll I will have 10 minutes and I'll hand it over to Dara to moderate the questions. Um, sure. Not everybody speak at once, right? Um, yes, fast finger first. Sure. Thank you for doing such a important 
hard by staff full circle from 100 years ago to today. Um, especially in like light of the fact that Biden, of course, just famously in Ireland and is very clear personally what Ireland needs and has lost its hand to its ancestry. Um, and looking back at essentially the points made about the US and I'm wondering you know, how much of that you know, it's not something that we not tolerate a lot of people who came from thousands of kids and was, you know, pretty committed to an ancestry that was not of Irish nationalist ilk in any way. Um, and I wonder if you sort of, you know, in the later instances, or something, I think personal, you know, information of that is being informed by the politicians on the right today to this country. Um, and if so, how that have turned it. Yeah, it's an, it's an excellent question. Um, so obviously he was of Ulster Presbyterian uh, ancestry. Um, he could trace his ancestry back to Tyrone, uh, is my knowledge. Um, but I think in some respects he was, in his refusal to recognize Ireland, he's purely playing the pragmatic power politics of the day. Um, and the United States, but also Great Britain, were the victors of the war. And uh, with the victors come the spoils and also the first draft of history. So uh, in many ways, Wilson, I think, um, was unwilling to allow what is essentially an exemplary case of, our, of self-determination in the case of Ireland to spoil his geostrategic plans. Number one, of course, being the passing of the League of Nations, and he needed Britain, France, and other allied powers to support that. Um, it is notable that during 1919, he was unwilling to meet de Valera, despite the fact that de Valera had this celebrity He's addressing crowds in Fenway Park, Madison Square Garden, and other and otherwise. So he couldn't, but you know, he couldn't have ignored him. Um, I think in part the reason for that as well was because of Irish Americans. And he very famously, perhaps infamously, used the term hyphenated Americans uh during the campaign for the midterms that year, as I as I recall, referring to the fact that the League of Nations legislation was defeated in the Senate. He blamed Cohalan and other Irish Americans. And I think in that regard, De Valera and Co were basically collateral damage in, in that regard. So, um, and of course, he, he suffered a stroke soon after this, which didn't really allow for any kind of revision of that position. So, thank you. Colin, sure. Can you, can you tell us about the other, the other spaces? So th these were not the only ones, right? So you think about the Irish race congresses, like all of the other places where at some point the sort of center of gravity shift. You mentioned a few of them, you might give us a sort of a sense of what they were like. Yeah, so the reason why I chose though for those four um, identity spaces or, or, or decision spaces because I'm tracking movements of power and how Irish nationalists at the time contemporaneously understood the, the, the mechanisms of power and real politic effectively. So I do see that those are vectors between cities. And that's not to say, as you correctly point out, that there were other machinations going on at that time. There was, like you said, uh, represent, representations of an early Irish foreign policy in parts of most notably Central and uh, continental Europe. Um, and again, and the ambassador would probably be aware of this, but what's really interesting about, for example, the Irish diplomacy efforts at this time is that women were given um, considerable um, responsibility, visibility in international posts, Nazi vice power we've mentioned before in Berlin, more in Ukraine, in Madrid, um, but, you know, in contradistinction to the politics of masculinity back in, back in Dublin, which was very gendered. Um, so there is a greater equality, for example, in the Irish early Irish foreign policy, most notably in Europe. There's also, um, in some respects, relationships with other anti-colonial movements of the global south. I didn't really have time today because, well, as the ambassador noted, it's an unethical task to try and map the Irish world in 45 minutes or so. Um, but like, for example, Sean Hugh Kelly, was meet, when he was in Paris, was meeting with the likes of Ho Chi Minh who would later become leader of Vietnam, who was also seeking international recognition for his people from President Woodrow Wilson. Um, there are relationships with Egyptian activists, Saad Zaglou uh, in many different cities, um, Indian activists and so on. And, and I think the point however still stands that it's beyond Ireland where these um, connections were happening. So there is, if you take for example, the records of Dáil Éireann in the National Archives in Dublin and you go through them, 
you get a very bilateral understanding of what the Irish world was. It's Sean Kelly writing back to Dublin, De Valera writing back to Sean Kelly. However, if you look at Sean Kelly's papers and the papers of Sadzik Lul in Egypt, you get a more circuitous sense of a community of transnational activists at that time who were responsive and empathetic to each other's needs. And um, the archives in Dublin, like any national archive, tend to present a hierarchy of historical interest. So they'll focus in on what was happening in Dublin, what was happening at an institutional level in the Dáil cabinet and Dáil area. The papers which transcend the island tend to show cosmopolitanism, internationalism, and you know solidarities with other anti-colonial movements. So that's all to look forward to, maybe for another day. Um, but it's really a remarkable moment. The book is subtitled Ireland's Global Moment, because I truly feel, we discussed this with other members of the department before, that this is a truly global moment of which Ireland is a part. And I, I distinguish it from a Wilsonian moment, in which Wilson dictates what the terms of internationalism are. In 1919 to 1923, anti-colonial activists decide on global moments on their own terms, and in Ireland's case, in their own times. Yes. Uh, you talked about how a lot of the supporters of the uh, Irish Relief State movement were not Irish themselves, which I, right. I found fascinating, but I assume a majority of them were like, for example, of those 15,000 people in Madison Square Garden, I'm sure a lot of those were Irish Americans. Um, as you get further along in the 20th century and now even into the 21st century, um, the Irish Americans are getting further and further away from that initial generation that immigrated. Um, how has that affected support for Ireland as a free state, if at all? So it's an excellent question in a number of ways. Excellent because it's uh, a really interesting idea. Also because uh, some of the people in the room will know that my second assignment for the students at the Modern Ireland course was to create a policy document to the Global Ireland Programme, the Department of Affairs Global Ireland Programme. One of the students who shall remain unnamed in the best interest of blind peer review uh, talked about exactly that, the intergenerational memory being lost on the part of the next generation of Irish Americans. And he put together a really creative set of proposals by which the Department of Foreign Affairs in Dublin can recapture and re-engage young um, Irish Americans in this case, in terms of making connections with their Irish ancestry, creating, for example, educational relationships with Irish universities, um, and the rather tricky issue of an Irish vote for presidential, or Irish diaspora vote for presidential election. So there's a range uh, and a spectrum of issues by which the Irish government today can re-engage with the Irish diaspora, specifically the next generation that you're referring to. But I think it's really, really important at an institutional level back in Dublin that there isn't a singular standard vision or version of the Irish diaspora. Um, and I think that's recognized in many policy documents today. I mean, the idea of the affinity diaspora for example, is very much part of the vocabulary of the Global, Global Ireland Programme. In fact, someone like Annie Vivanti 100 years ago will be considered today a part of the Affinity Diaspora, non-Irish born, but still embedded in, you know, supporting Irish causes. Yes. It's curious to me that the Irish in 1919 uh, were uh, not doing so well, so we weren't yet well. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in the story of first generation of Irish, of the Irish, you know, the non Irish, uh, which was not uh, only away from the reason why uh, we were talking. And so we were hoping that stuff like that. So it's interesting that the, uh, I just, I just found that uh, getting, getting very, I don't even know where that takes us. It was a discussion, I'm not making a point, I'm making an observation that Irish Catholics in this country were, uh, well, not well involved, but well, well into the 50s and 60s. Uh, and we're talking here about something in World War, that the World War I, you know, was busted forward on the markets in Luxembourg, which uh, I understood. What's your reaction to that? Again, a fascinating point, and I'm really glad that you brought it up, because, of course, in terms of memory, we need to think beyond this period that we're focusing on today, you know, the, to the period of the Irish Revolution and into that. The, the, the after effects of the creation of the Irish state. And I've made, raised this point in several publications and in several presentations that I think, for example, that the Irish state, the Irish migrant has suffered a double exile from Ireland, both in terms of leaving the Irish state and leaving its historical memory. So I think it's really important that we reintegrate 
the Irish diaspora uh, on, in principle to the, to, to the writing and researching and presentation of Irish history. Um, specifically to your point about the absence or diminution of an Irish American identity, or rather its salience, perhaps in more of a Catholic identity. I think it's really interesting that you talk about that in that period. And I wonder in some respect, and this again was raised in the classroom, I won't again mention the name of the person who raised it, but how did De Valera, let's say in 1919, 1920, get these crowds of 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 coming out to see him? And I wonder, is there a kind of um, a reverse psychology here? I mean, the ambassador referenced not only President Biden coming to Ireland this year, a president who acknowledges that he is Irish American, but also when President Kennedy arrived in 1963, it was this great homecoming, right, for the Irish people. But here is one of our own sons. Kennedy said himself, it took me 115 years and three generations to get here. Um, and I wonder in some respects, was De Valera's tour as president of the Irish Republic a kind of reverse, a reversal of that in the United States where Irish people, or if they self-identified as Catholic, saw this as a moment of community, a moment of ethnic recognition because the president of the Irish Republic was coming to America. So I'm just wondering if that's something that might have marked, again, a moment in the Irish American experience. We'll um, give that a break. <laughs> Although I know that he's available for uh, for being buttonholed uh, immediately yeah. after this. Please um, join me in thanking Mara. I just want to say before we um, that Dara has been with us since September as a visitor, and you can probably get a sense from this presentation what a generous welcome visitor he's been um, in Porsche and how much he has given to our students and to us and how much his projects have brought to the work that we do here. So Dara, thank you for that. And thanks for a really fascinating talk. And thank all of you for listening so rapidly. Thank you. Um, Bar is open. <laughs>